a fine show for you tonight. Uh, no, sit down. We really do. Stay <laughs> Former Boston Celtics basketball star and coach, now uh, you've seen him in the beer commercials, Mr. Tom Heinsohn is here tonight. <laughs> And a gentleman I first uh, became uh, familiar with when I was attending Ball State University back in sunny Muncie, Indiana. This man was performing at the 67 Club, so named because it was right there on Highway 67. No club, just right there on the highway. Uh, Wayne Cochran will be out here later. And also tonight we begin a fascinating uh, three-part series, I believe this is tonight, a look at men and their inventions. That'll be taking place on this show tonight and tomorrow night and the following night. Now, last night I mentioned that Lily Tomlin was going to be here tonight, uh, but when she heard we were doing the Happy Clown, she said, I'd rather stay home and watch it in the comfort of my living room. So she will be with us tomorrow night. Say hello now to Mr. Paul Schaefer, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. This thing's a great chance. Thomas, not ready. Paul Schaefer, Thunder Bay's own Paul Schaefer. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> Thank you so much. My next guest has been called the great white father of blues in the 1950s. He looked nothing like the other popular white performers. And instead of sounding like Pat Boone, he sounded more like Otis Redding and Little Richard. His style has since influenced musicians ranging from the Blues Brothers to Rod Stewart. It's a pleasure to welcome, performing on a rare occasion here tonight, the legendary Wayne Cochran. <laughs>
you got the best band on television. They're awfully, awfully good. About you, uh, well, not a long time ago. This is in the late '60s. You were working at a place called the '67 Wink Wink Supper Club, <laughs> and uh, they said <laughs> <laughs> that's Michelin's highest rating for a supper club. By the way, ladies and gentlemen, uh, they said you got to go out there. There's a guy who, who uh, has the biggest hair on a human you're ever going to see, <laughs> and occasionally he'll toss something through the window. He used to toss chairs through the place, huh? Like your first time I ever did that. Yep. 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 And this I love one. westerns, you know. And every western is a good bar fight, saloon fight, where a chair yeah. always went through the yeah. window. Well, that's that's one thing Muncie needs more of. Yeah. Bar and fights. Scott. It hardly ever happens in Muncie. Uh, you're a, a, a bona fide music legend. Uh, you have influenced. Uh, we uh, listed people from the, the Blues Brothers to. Uh, um, Rod Stewart, and on and on and on, and there are hints of your music and what you've done uh, in other performers today. Does does it bother you that you're still uh, not that you're not famous, but you're not a you're not a superstar really in the world of music? Oh, but I'm the first time in my life uh, I, I'm the kind of star I want to be. I've given in to a star, I've become the subject of one. And and what? Ask me how happy I am. Can I answer that, Paul? I won't answer that. How happy would you be? <laughs> How happy would you be if you know the whole reason for creation and every moment of history was to prepare, give birth to, and prepare a bride for the Son of God to help him rule and reign forever, and everything and every second live until this moment was in preparation of that, and you was part of the bride instead of just part of the creation. Would you be happy? That's how happy I am. Let's, uh, I got that in. Let's, let's just talk about bar fights. You want to? <laughs> uh, we're going to turn right back. We'll talk some more with Mr. Wade. First time I saw you was in the Pixie Diner in Muncie, and you really, <laughs> you, <laughs> the you, Pixie Diner. Yeah, you, but you came in and you really had some hair then, Wayne. And this was uh, in the mid to late '60s. What was the origin of the the hair you had there? I mean, I know biologically the origin, but <laughs> I really, I, I don't know. I just see. I live in a little town called Thomason, Georgia, and and all you ever had was newsreels on Saturday night, and they would show the premieres of the movies. And, you know, they had Mink Lion Thunderbirds, you know, and all their glamour. And I thought it was part of show business. And what I did was naively sit in front of my house, a little $20 a month house in Thomas, and listen to the radio in my daddy's car all night every night, and imagine what was happening at the Metropole in New York. Because <coughs> I figured one day I was going to try to get there. So what I did then was put together a band doing what I thought I would have seen if I'd have walked in the Metropole. Yeah. Only when I got there, I found out that there was nobody doing it. <laughs> yeah. but, but you so from stupidity, I created it. No. And the hair was part of it. Yeah. But you you saw uh, uh, Edgar and Johnny Winter? I actually I had, was working in a place called a Boom Boom Room in Shreveport, Louisiana. Bossier City, Louisiana. And down the street at a place they called a the Beverly Lounge, I had been messing with my hair, trying to get what I wanted. I really couldn't figure it out. And there was a young group called It and Them. Uh -huh. <laughs> they were like 16, 18 years old from Beaumont, Texas. Two of them were albinos. And there was a great thing about their hair. Every time the lights over their head changed colors, their hair changed colors. And I said, now there's the color. If I could figure out how to get it. So I hired me a hairdresser from Muncie, Indiana. And we got a hairdresser to buy the bleach, and he left there with me on the road. And we bleached that. Man, I'm telling you, we must have bleached it for two or three days, and it come up strawberry red and then about fell out. Because uh -huh. <laughs> it was really ugly. Cool. But we finally got it on platinum, and he teased it up in sort of a bouquet, you know, like a, the old Trojan Warriors, you know. Oh, it was the, when I saw it, yeah, it was the size of an end table when I saw it. <laughs> <laughs> 
They were really about the only people I could sing to. The first year and a half of my career was done on, on the black circuit then. You go to Buffalo, a place like Pine Grill Inn, the Apollo here in New York. You, first place I played in New York was Apollo Theater in mm -hmm. 1964. Uh, and this was a haven for uh, James Brown and those kind of acts before well, they Yeah, see, I grew up with Otis and James and Little Richard and uh, the horns and everything. So like I say, I thought that was commonplace. Mm -hmm. So that's why we put together an R&B band. And I had been hanging out with them. and. To me, Rhythm and Blues were nothing but a, but a more intense rock. It was like a black rock. It was a little more intense than Top 40 rock. And once you ever sung it and expressed yourself, you really couldn't just go back to Top 40 rock. It was light. It was like, I don't know, it's like after feeling a good whack on a tree, it's like picking up a sponge axe and trying it again. Mm -hmm. It just, nothing ever happened. Yeah. So I stayed with it. Yeah. And uh, tried to learn. Well, I think just by hanging out with my friends and the people that I began to know in the black community, Learn not only the music, but the roots of it. That was what was important. You know what uh, I was surprised to hear uh, or actually read about you today? The time that I would have seen you uh, in, in Muncie, uh, you were under the impression you were dying, weren't you? You were on the road under with the notion that you had uh, only a few months to live. Well, I played around Macon there in Thomaston. I finally moved to Macon and played there. And uh, <coughs> I had a doctor tell me I had throat cancer. He said my vocal cords were, I remember the expression where I said they were hanging like moth-eaten in shreds. Ooh. And uh, he told me that I could never sing again, and that if I let him operate that day and put a box in there, that he might could save my life. Otherwise, there was really no hope. And uh, he says, you can try a voice rest. He says, but uh, I really don't think there's no hope for it. I remember walking out. That was, I think it was the first day I really began to appreciate life. I heard a car horn. <laughs> that don't sound like much. But when you, all of a sudden you think of how many dead men would give the riches of the world to hear that car horn, and it began to count more. And I had always wanted to be a road musician. In the old days, you know, that was all it was to it. You just didn't get the band and the chords. You hit the road. Yeah. So I took my band and left because I figured I had, you know, 90 days to live. And I was going to do what I always wanted to do, and I figured when I got too weak, you know, I'd just come home. Did you, uh, ever did you feel like the, if, in fact, there was a disease, that it would ever progressed, or? Uh... No. In fact, uh, it started getting better. And I tell you, the strange feeling is waking up on the 91st day. Really? Because it's, you really believe it. You know? <laughs> uh, that's uh, truly amazing. Um, uh, well, uh, it, you know, we had... This is a weird show, man. Man, I mean, I quit being a freak. I'm born again. I'm a minister of the gospel, and I'm on the Dave Letterman show. Praise God! I love it. I love it. Uh, Woo! Say glory. Uh, <laughs> we had uh, uh, a contemporary. A contemporary. Ain't life good? Go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, we had a contemporary of yours on a couple of weeks ago, Little Richard. Praise God. And Praise you God. guys had nearly the same kind of musical origin, and yeah. you both come around. Now he's out. Uh, making money, <coughs> not making money, I'm sorry. He, he's out <laughs> preaching the gospel. I, I had him mixed up with another little Richard who was out making money. I tell you what, I tell you what, now you hear that a lot, but see, uh, I, I think a crime only bites those who are guilty. And uh, I'll tell you this, the, the most drastic step ever made in my life was last May, the Lord called me into a full-time ministry, and at that time I was used to having a job or getting a weekly paycheck. And when you have a lot of bills, and you realize that on this Monday morning you're not looking for a job and you don't have one, and you really don't know how you pay your bills, you just have to depend on it, and your wife knows that. It's the most frightening step in the world at the beginning to say, okay, I know the Lord can do it. How? How, man? How? Because it's not a joyous truth in the beginning, but it works. We're going to, we're going to pause. We'll be right back.
gentlemen will be here. Have a good night.